reading is just a habit you got to form in all of life. Books don't change people's sentences. Reading good, solid, reform, spiritual literature, reading especially the classics, that's had the biggest impact on my life. Well, good day and welcome to another Reformers Bookcast. Um, we're here today at Reformers Bookshop and we have a guest with us, James Jeffrey. Thanks for joining us, James. Yeah, thanks for inviting me over, Tom. Uh, how are you going today? Yeah, I'm going pretty well. Um, I'm enjoying this season where it's getting a bit warmer. I love summer, so me yeah. and my wife are really excited for summer. And we also found out recently that she's pregnant, so Very that's also really good news. Yeah, That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, we've had you on before, so we won't, we won't do too much in terms of yep. introduction. But um, today, we are going to be talking about uh, the idea of biblical meditation. Uh, and so I thought to begin with, uh, have you ever thought about meditation before? I think um, I, I haven't thought about it intentionally as much as I did when I read this book. I always knew that it was important to uh, fill, your minds with, fill your mind with things of Christ and things of His Word. Um, but I didn't really know what sort of process to take with this, what it looks like, um, what it's looked like throughout Christian history, mm. what people have said about it. And so I think this book really helped to consolidate things, provide some helpful definitions, uh, and provide some uh, some pointers for how to go forward and really intentionally use my time to yeah. um, to meditate on God and His Word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think the, these days the idea of meditation in some way, like that word, is used a lot uh, and mm. it's encouraged by the, the secular world. Yeah. Um, so... I, I thought let's let's start with what, what are the different types of meditation that that are going on. Yeah, uh, so there's uh, that meditation in Eastern religions, so Eastern spirituality, which involves uh, emptying your mind of mm. all of its desires and attachments in order to achieve a state of enlightenment or nirvana. And I think that this um, or inner peace or something. Yeah, right? some yeah. inner peace. And so this form of meditation is all about emptying the mind, um, whereas uh, biblical meditation is all about filling the mind. Um, not filling the mind with endless tasks to make us overwhelmed and anxious, but to fill our minds with biblical truth about God, about His Word, uh, and to dwell on the eternal realities and truths that we ought to be storing as treasures in our hearts. Yeah. Mm. And I, I think that the idea of emptying our minds sounds so attractive, um, right? Because, I mean, the typical answer you get when, when you ask someone how they're going is busy. Yep. Uh, we're, we, it's well known today that there's so much information available. I, read, I think I read somewhere that there, I think it was an unverified fact, but, <laughs> but someone, someone said that in a, a weekend edition of like the New York Times, there's more information than your typical French nobility would have back in the Middle yeah. Ages in their whole life, that sort yeah. of thing, right? And you so, add to that all the social media and all of the new sites we're reading and the books we're reading, it's, that's it's right. overwhelming at times. So we have yeah. this, this constant flow of information uh, these constant tasks to tick yep. off. Um, we, we, we seem to uh, feel that our workplaces are, are so uh, intense, mm. you know, lo lots of things to do, endless lists. And so this idea of clearing our minds seems really attractive, Yeah, I think, to achieve peace. Um, but it, what's, what's the problem with that? Uh, I think the problem is uh, if we try and empty our minds of things, we'll end up inevitably filling our minds with other things. So it's impossible to empty our minds completely. Um, and secondly, it's actually quite dehumanizing to try and empty ourselves because we weren't designed to do that, mm. designed to fill ourselves with yeah. Christ and to relate to him. And so it's almost like in, um, in a marriage, if you just tried to solve your marital problems by just pulling away and trying to isolate yourself and not dealing with those issues and you know becoming more intimate with your partner um, th through just loving them and communicating it had become quite toxic and you become this isolated individual who become quite callous and quite hard. And um, sort of like what C.S. Lewis says, when you don't love, you become uh, like this locked away mm. uh, person in a casket who is so, um, so sort of stoic that he can't be affected by emotions anymore. Yeah. And I wonder whether that's sort of the product of this sort of meditation. Well, there's, there's that classic, um, I think it's Simon and Garfunkel song, isn't it? I'm, I'm a rock. I'm an yep. island. Yep. I won't be affected by the things around me. But but the result is what a rock. Yeah, it's not. That's right. <laughs> it's and, not and, what you're and meant ironically, to be. Um, and ironically, Eastern spirituality often presents itself as this uh, selfless, uh, loving religion or s a series of philosophies. But it's actually one of the most selfish worldviews because it's all about personal liberation and personal enlightenment. And so mm. I wonder whether um, that actually plays into 
the the um the anguish that we experience if we do go down that path because mm. we mm. realize that we're actually detaching ourselves from everything we were made to be by God in this world. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's great. Um, so we brought a couple of books along on this topic. Um, so let, I'll I'll just introduce them. Uh, so I I've got this one. This is not a, obviously not a book. It's a book that's not quite here yet, but it's called Deeper Still by Linda Alcock. I'll tell you a bit about that later on. And you brought along God's Battle Plan for the Mind. That's right. Yep. Um, so why don't you start by giving us a, a definition of biblical meditation yeah. as opposed to Eastern <coughs> meditation from this book here. Yeah, so God's Battle Plan for the Mind is a book um, all about the Puritans and what they said about biblical meditation. And there's a bunch of really helpful definitions. I'll just pick one by Thomas Watson. Uh, Thomas Watson said, Meditation is a holy exercise of the mind whereby we bring the truths of God to remembrance and do seriously ponder upon them and apply them to ourselves. Meditation is the soul's retiring of itself so that by a serious and solemn thinking upon God, the heart may be raised up to heavenly affections. Mm. So it's a, it's, I like, I like that how it's uh, thinking about the truths and then applying the truths to ourselves. That's right. So it's not just about locking ourselves in a closet and thinking about Bible verses. It's actually about seeing how are these divine truths transforming my life and uh, doing some serious heart excavation um, as to how we can be better um, living in a, as our gospel identities in Christ um, with the promises that we have from him. Mm. And so it's becoming more and more conformed to the image of Jesus as we do this. Yeah. So you, you've... So th- this book, the God's Battle Plan for the Mind, is looking at the Puritans on meditation. So obviously, biblical meditation is an idea that goes back at least to the 1500s or yeah. six, 1700s thereabouts. Um, so it's not new. Uh, how far back does the idea of biblical meditation yeah. go? Yeah, oh, it goes back as as far as we can look, really. I'm sure that God would have uh, spoken to Adam and Eve in such terms if we had more of his conversations with them. Um, but Psalm chapter 1, you know, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Yeah. This is David's delight. Uh, we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, the commands by God are to store up these things in our hearts and to write them on the doorposts of our house, on the signets of our minds. All of these um, all of these divine truths are never to just be merely intellectual, but they should be shaping everything. And that's why, uh, the, uh, that's why God in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is so encouraging of his people to teach them to their children from a very young age so that they'll grow up um, seeing this as a normal practice. Yeah, and, yeah. and even the way that they're meant to teach in Deuteronomy 6 is uh, essentially a method of meditation. Yeah. Talking about it, thinking about it while you're sitting down, while you're standing up, while you're lying down, while you're walking in the way. That's right, it's, yeah. It's this, uh, I mean, L- Linda in her book, Deeper Still, um, brings out this idea that we all meditate all we the do, time. Yeah. Um, we, we're thinking, we're meditating on, um, the jobs we have at home or we're meditating on that annoying person in our life or, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, we're always thinking and processing all these different things uh, all the time. And so she's just said, saying, well, actually what we need to do is train our thoughts yep. in all of those moments to think about Christ, think about That's right. God and his word and what he said to us. Yeah, I wonder whether part of this, as the book suggests, God's battle plan for the mind is about viewing ourselves as soldiers for Christ um, employing that imagery that's used by Paul in, say, Ephesians chapter 6, where he says um, to stand firm in the Lord and to put on his armor. Mm. Uh, we need to be actively engaging in this warfare because if we're not fighting, we're actually going to be falling. Um, as soon as someone goes into a battle uh, unequipped, they're doomed to failure. And I wonder whether we feel so much disillusionment at times with how uh, how we struggle with this, how we struggle with meditation, because we don't put in these tactics and strategies which God has given us to to, um, to meditate and to really grow in Christ. Yeah, and well, and I, I, I think you're very right because the idea of uh, being in a battle involves discipline, involves um, neglecting, or not neglecting, but denying yourself. You, yeah. you know, you have to get up early. You have to yeah. do those exercises. Um, yep. the, the army is full of these concepts of discipline. You have to iron your, your shirts and all those yes. sort of things. Prepare yourself. Yeah. Go over the strategy. Go over it again. Learn plan A, plan B, plan C. Yeah. Um, and so... And, but we don't like that. No. We, we like to sort of go with the flow, right? Yeah. Um, Part of the struggle, I think, is that when, we, when Christians view, say, going to the gym four or five times a week, they view it as, oh, this is getting fit. But reading your Bible four or five times a week, that's legalism. 
Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem we have is that setting disciplines is not so much because we want to justify ourselves by God, but because we know how weak we are. We know how prone we are to sin. And so unless we intentionally carve out time free from distractions, um, free from other responsibilities, we just won't do these things um, in an intentional and in a uh, way that's sustainable for the long term. Yeah. 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 Uh, so before we go into pr- some practical ways, why don't you tell me what you liked about God's battle plan for the mind? Yeah, uh, I just, I love reading the Puritans, uh, but sometimes they're a bit cumbersome to read through, like, especially like John Owen and some of the, well, some yeah. of the heavy I mean, lifters. <laughs> this is, this is a Puritan work on solitude improved by divine meditation. You can see it's, yeah. it, it will have riches in there, <laughs> but you'll have to dig to find them. Yeah, it's, um, it's sort of like dipping your feet in the water. If you, if you want to just see what the Puritans are like, I think they, Puritans have this reputation as being these people who denied themselves of joy and who just lived these miserable lives. But they really were people who knew the Lord, loved the Lord, and who I think really made use of the means of grace. Mm. And so that's what I loved most is getting into church history, seeing how brothers and sisters in the past have engaged with God, wrestled with him, um, and how they'd grown through biblical meditation. It sort of just gives me hope as well that it's actually possible. Um, even in all their weaknesses, even in all their struggles, they're able to see that there's hope in this mm. life to grow with Christ. Even before we get to the new creation, there's hope to grow. Yeah. So, so you're getting all the all the nuggets, all the riches out of the Puritans, yeah, in, in put in a really easy to approach way. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think that the other thing that it gave was a really apt diagnosis of our society and how distracted and notification heavy we are, um, and how we really need to be prepared going to this world. We ne- we need to be intentional about mm, this if mm. we're really going to win the battle. Otherwise, we're going to have five million other gospels preached to us throughout the week and which one are we going to be believing if we're not filling our minds with the truths of christ yeah yeah very good uh okay so deeper still is the the book that i read um it's a a new one that's come out by linda alcock uh and what what i liked about it is it's really really simple uh it's it's super easy to read um and she breaks meditation down into uh five really practical, simple steps that you can work through and they're mm. all very uh, very simple to put into place. Um, obviously, it's more challenging on the day-to-day, but but then it's not a complex concept um, That's right, yeah. in, in the way that she presents it. So I found that really helpful. That's, that's super helpful, yeah. Oh, no, I should have shared before on the previous page, um, before the definitions of a meditation, I'm sure it was. it's probably similar to what uh, Alcock says, but... Biblical meditation is dwelling or thinking, considering, pondering, setting one's mind or affections on something and remembering. Just these easy words that we, we do every day. Yeah. But to, to do that with scripture and to do that with, with the truths of God. Yeah. yeah and, and Linda uses very similar, similar um, language, yeah. language and, and also similar illustrations of ways that we already meditate. And yep. so you can see very tangibly, oh, I, that's, that's where I need to shift my thinking. Um, where I'm meditating on that, I need to be meditating on Christ, th- those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because I think these uh, Puritans and even Alcock, they understand that the control center of the human is the human heart, and the heart is shaped by what we dwell on in our mind. Yeah. And so there's this process that goes on. And so if we can get control of the mind, if we can allow God to be uh, Lord of our minds, our behaviors will start to radically change over time, and we'll, become, we'll be able to become a lot more like Christ, God willing, over time. Yeah, and, and, and in our society, we, we tend to like to make a fight between affections or our emotions and uh, intel, uh, intellect mm. and, and rationality. But uh, like you say, the Puritans, and I think biblically that that fight doesn't exist. They feed into each other. And so you have that wonderful passage, renewing your mind with, mm. with the word. Yep. Um, that's, that's God's intention for us. We are to dwell on things. And what does that produce? Well, the psalmist tells you he delights in exactly. the law that he meditates yeah. on. And so as, as we exercise our intellect in thinking about God and meditating on him, yeah. that impacts our affections, which impacts our will, which impacts our deeds. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Through, right? Yeah. There's um, some denominations today that so focus on the experience and the heart of things, and they are almost anti-intellectual. And then there's those denominations which are so intellectual that it's if you, if you delve into that heart stuff, you're, you know, you're going off the charismatic spectrum. But those... The heart of it and the mind of um, our our hearts and our minds ought to be coming together in biblical meditation to to honor and love God. Yeah. All right. So let, let's dig into the practical elements of this. What 
What does biblical meditation look like on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that it looks different for different people, um, but there's two main types of biblical meditation, uh, which I'd say are sort of um, present in my own life but are expounded in this book, so I'd really encourage you to, to read them. Uh, there's, this, uh, there's occasional meditation, which is that meditation which happens impromptu throughout the day. So mm-hmm. when you're just walking through um, your garden and you're praising God that he is yeah, the Lord yeah. of all creation. That's um, great. Yeah. Uh, Linda describes that as the white space around your yeah. book. Uh, she says it, there's all these white spaces in our lives, little moments, and what do we tend to do with them? Well, if you're anything like me, we tend to flick through Facebook or, or, yeah. Inst- or Instagram or check our emails or something yeah. like that in those free spaces. Like when you're waiting for the bus or uh, when you're um, waiting for the kettle to boil, you know, th- mm. things like that where you have these little moments. So you're, you're saying we can do occasional meditation there. Yeah. Uh, how, what, what are we to think about in those moments? Yeah. What, what are some triggers that we yeah. can look to? to yeah. Yeah. So we're not, us? we're not looking into the clouds, say, if we're walking in the garden, looking for God's name spelt in the sky, but we're looking at the world through the lens of Christ and through the lens of his word. Um, and so when we look at the, the plants that he's made, we can praise him for his creation is good. Yeah. He's made these intricately designed, um, wonderful creations, all of this flora for his glory and for our good. Uh, and so we can praise him for that. Um, we, we can also see illustrations in nature, for, especially for preachers, for how, um, how biblical truths um, can be explained to their congregations uh, in a way that's understandable and comprehensible. And that's often what, what Jesus does even a- in his absolutely. ministry. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I, I'm of the opinion that, that, that that's not just for preachers. Um, I think it's fascinating to think about how God actually built this world from scratch. Yeah. So... He, he got to choose everything. And so when he um, makes a caterpillar turn into a butterfly, that wasn't just yeah. like a, an accident random, or anything. Yeah. He did it to show us the, his amazing character. Yeah. Um, that's, a re- that's a really good point. Even when we think about drinking water, for instance, like exactly. water is supposed to point us to Christ who's the living water. Yeah. Who and provides that everlasting. <laughs> We're doing a series of the I yeah. am's yeah. statements. Yeah. And I, I love that they're all so... Uh, tangible and practical. I'm. Yep. I'm. Uh, he doesn't quite say I'm the living water, but he does yeah, say yeah. He, he does. It's not an I am statement, but he does yeah. claim that uh, I'm the bread of life. Yep. I'm the door. All of these things. And, and so I, world, I remember yeah. Joel Beakey talking about um, how a Puritan would meditate on the on the statement I am the door, yep. and he's like, well, every time they see a door, they'd be thinking, oh, isn't it so wonderful that that Jesus provides a way in to God? Yeah, isn't it wonderful that it's not locked? Yes, that that it's an it's an open door, and I just need to reach out in faith and, and walk through. Yep. You know all all of these things, and and just the Bible is so full of, and the world is so full of these tangible, physical things that we can yes. hook onto and use as, as a a tool for meditating absolutely, on Christ. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And those tools are really easy because they're so tangible, as you said, and because uh, they're so uh, visual. Yeah. So we can dwell on Christ in those ways. Yeah. It's a great kindness, isn't it? For it the, is, for yeah. the invisible God to reveal himself in these ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's Psalm 19, isn't it? That it is. The creation reveals the glory of God. And so as we're walking around, we, we, uh, Linda brings out this, this idea that the, the concept of mindfulness, which is a um, secular or, or yep. Eastern um, idea of meditation where you need to be, um, just hyper aware of your surroundings. Mm. She's like, there's an element of truth in that. Yeah, we we walk around without noticing the mm. the clouds that God provides, the the rain on the just and the unjust. You know, thing things like that. We we do we should look. We should be aware. One hundred percent. Yeah. So that's good. That's one helpful. Um, Absolutely. Hook for yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for momentary or what did you call it? Occasional meditation. Occasional meditation. Yeah. And any other hooks? Um, so then there's the deliberate meditation. Do you want me to go there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's let, go there. Let, yeah. Yep. Let's have a look at deliberate. <laughs> so there's there's occasional meditation. Uh, there's deliberate meditation, which is that time that you have carved out of your day, especially to serve the Lord uh, by dwelling on His Word and by just spending active time in prayer with Him. So this might look like for some people, um, first thing when they wake up, just getting their Bible out. Um, getting getting into a, a room that's not overly distracting mm-hmm. uh, with lots of things all around, you know, turning off your phone and just reading God's word and, and praying that he would apply it to your hearts. Mm. And I think often this can just be a few verses. Uh, yeah. the, he, the author, uh, David Saxon, says that um, sometimes it's best in these times of biblical meditation that we just pick a couple of verses so that we can get 
uh, one central truth and just let it really sink into our hearts rather than trying to cover chapters and chapters, swaths of information. Um, that has its place in the Christian life. Uh, but for meditation, we really need to hone in on one thing and really let that become ingrained into our life and our hearts. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's something that Linda brings out as well. So I, I think even if you are reading, um, going through a Bible reading plan mm. where you're reading, say, four chapters a day or something yeah. like that, um, you can, we're, 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 we're so weak. You can only really think about one thing yeah. um, and hold on to that and consider it throughout the day. So she, she gives these examples where it, she'll, she might read a whole chapter or a couple of chapters and she'll just look for that one truth um, that strikes her about God or about us or about Christ and she'll, um, she'll just mentally note it or she might write it on her hand or something like that to, yeah. so that she can yeah. think about it. So it acts as a trigger throughout the day. That's right. Drawing back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I like that idea of just focusing on one thing and then and then praising God or yeah. praying God to God, thanking Him, repenting yeah. in, that, in that moment during right. your day. I think personally, I find it's help, most helpful in the morning. This is just what I found in my walk with God because it it turns out that it shapes everything in my day. If I'm able to do this in the morning and consistently think back to that, it's obviously very difficult to do that even when you read in the morning. Um, but it's a good starting place to be. It's sort of giving God your first fruits and letting that direct the rest of your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, like that, uh, I think often we have this idea that that has to be like an hour at four a.m. in the morning, um, you know, in a dark room by yourself. But uh, people who have early early work hours or um, lots of kids or yeah, um, you know, all, all those sorts of difficulties that come in and squeeze out time. Uh, how how long is your quiet time in the morning? Yeah, I, I try and spend about half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, that's the sort of time that I find really helpful. And then later on in the day, I might just feel like I really need to spend some solid time in prayer. I'll try and uh, sort of occasionally pray throughout the day, but uh, deliberately sometimes I need to just sit down and confess that I'm not loving God with my mind and I need to just be brought back onto biblical truth. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so, so me, for example, I, I'll read on the train, which is however long that yeah. trip happens to take. Um, yeah, and that, that's something, a moment in my day that um, I've managed to that's carve so out. Yeah. But my wife, though, you know, she, we've got four kids, so she's getting up with the kids and getting them ready for school, taking them to school, that sort of thing. So she'll read sort of later in the morning, um, yeah. maybe when our baby's having a nap or something like that. That's yeah, right, so yeah. It's, it's, I think it's, it's good to find that a to, time yeah. that works for you. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. I think um, there, was, there was a line in here where, uh, Saxon says, just find the time that's right for you and just uh, stick with that and, and see how you go with it. Because everyone, as you said, has different schedules and there's different um, different things in life that demand our attention. So it's yeah, important yeah. to realize that God's gracious, I think, and understanding with that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, personally, I've found that uh, even having a shorter a shorter time as I can fit in mm -hmm. um, is good. And, I, and I'm really, really thankful for that. Um, there's occasional meditations. Yeah. I think that's been something that's really helped me yeah. um, train train my thoughts. Um, and so I think it's good to have this balance. I think often we can have this idea that the Christian life is a quiet time in the morning and then you go and live your day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if I can't have an hour quiet time, then I'm not no. living a Christian yeah, life. Yeah, I'm a deficient Christian, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. even if you can have five minutes in the Word while you're scoffing down your cereal, find one thing to think about yep. and pray as you walk out into the car to drive to exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a good thing, and then really utilize that occasional yeah. meditation as you're getting your coffee on your coffee break or 100%. those sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's the quality of it, isn't it? Rather than just a sheer quantity. Yeah, I think a lot of Christians are overwhelmed. Like, oh, I don't know how to spend an hour in the Bible in the morning or whatever. And it's like five minutes or ten minutes if you, we're just seriously and intentionally using this time. That's precious time. And that's if we right. do that over a year, you know, that's a massive amount of growth with the Lord. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep, I mean, it, yeah. If you if you read, yeah, you know, one one chapter in each day, you'd yeah. have read three hundred and sixty five chapters. By exactly, the end. Like, that's a huge it's massive, amount of, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, now, one one thing that struck me as I thought about biblical meditation is the parallel between meditation and preaching. Um, at, did did you? think about that at all as, as you read yeah I, I realized after i read this book that a lot of my preaching preparation uh ought to be meditation and sometimes 
is sometimes isn't, but I realize this wrestling process with God in the middle where I'm trying to work out what is, what are you saying in your word, Lord? Mm -hmm. And what do you want me to say to your people? Uh, that, that process is a process of biblical meditation and it's, it's okay to spend some time in that, in that place. Um, and it's okay to wrestle with God and to sort of feel frustrated with God at times and feel like actually have emotions with God. Mm. Um, and so I, I think for preachers, there's that, that, that component. And then there's the other component of look, when we look in the world, sort of that more occasional uh, meditation, we see illustrations that can be used to communicate the truths of God that we have been meditating on. And so I think that for preachers, this is immensely important. It's immensely important for all Christians, but especially um, if we're seeking to preach the word to other people and uh, give them a pattern and a, a method for doing this in their own personal lives. Mm. If that's what preaching is all about. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, and that's the thought that really struck me was that preaching should be um, an, an example to us of yes. what meditation looks like. And so exactly. as, as the preacher takes you know, that, that few verses or that chapter and you know, considers it from this angle and from that angle and applies it there and applies it here, yep. that's what meditation is. That's, that's what right. it looks like. And so yeah. really we should just be preaching to ourselves that text that we read that morning or, right, or the yeah. text that we're thinking about that week. That's right. Um, in many ways, um, preaching is an extended meditation in front of a congregation, isn't That's it? Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think the best, many of the best sermons are that. They that are, exactly. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, just to to finish, uh, I thought it'd be interesting. What What's something that you're going to change um, after you've read God's Battle Plan for yeah. the mind and thought? I, about I struggle when I wake up to just not use my phone or electronics first thing. So mm -hmm. I think that for me, I just need to dedicate that time to Lord and say. I just at, at this stage of life, I'm just going to not touch my electronics until I've spent just even a little bit of time in prayer with God mm -hmm. or some time in His Word, um, and I think that would be really helpful for me to grow as a Christian. Um, and I, the second thing is, I really want to um, carve out a little bit of time, some point in the day, whenever I'm free, to to spend some time more intentionally praying with God um, about what's going on in my day mm. and and treating my relationship with God as if it really is an active relationship yeah. rather than this passive relationship where I'm sort of just waiting for his sovereign plans to come and I'm not really engaging with God at all. So I really want to be um, praying to God throughout the day with an active relationship. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Those two things. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the thing that I thought that I, I would change is just that idea of, um, of grabbing that one idea out of whatever text I've, yep. I've read um, and, and consciously and purposefully considering it um, throughout throughout the day yeah um i think often i i'll read as part of my morning devotion or and, and I'm, i might pray about it um but then it's sort of gone and i don't think about that text again that day so uh, that was something that i thought was yeah. helpful and, that's really good yeah. advice yeah yeah well james it's been great having you on um yeah. thank and you again for the opportunity no yeah. not at all and uh, if you would, would like to know more about biblical meditation god's battle plan for the mind We'll give you all the guts of the Puritans on meditation. And Deeper Still is a really approachable, practical little book uh, to help you get started.